Okay, perfect. Well, uh, welcome everyone. I'm uh, Gerardo Garra Bonilla, I'm a family medicine physician. I graduated about four years ago. So congratulations to all the uh, new interns and the physicians that are uh, graduating. So, and, um, and today we're going to talk about uh, preventing physician burnout and uh, some tools that personally have been very useful for me. Um, so I want to uh, share this. Um, and uh, it's, it's something I'm very passionate about. And I actually started a company uh, offering some of these tools to to uh, physicians and, and uh, clinicians in, in general. Um, anyways, but um, uh, this is the uh, the topics that we're going to cover. Uh, first, we're going to talk about some of the rates of physician burnout, uh, the statistics and the causes. And then the second part of the uh, lecture, we're going to start talking about the, the tools that uh, we can use, uh, some of the workflows, uh, especially in the outpatient setting. Uh, we can talk a, bit, a little bit about inpatient too, uh, if there's time. And some of the best practices, uh, at least uh, for me, but also some some of them are recommended by the American Academy of uh, of Medicine. So uh, let's get going. Uh, and if you have any questions, please uh, just interrupt me. Um, I'm happy to to answer the questions. So first, the definition of um, what's physician burnout so there are three components um and uh some people uh now are calling it moral injury but uh but uh, physician burnout is more uh more common still and uh, so the first thing is uh emotional exhaustion so everyone can relate to that if uh, especially residents and then uh, the second one is uh, depersonalization. So this is when you're working your uh, night shift and you, after you see your 10th admission and you really don't care about uh, the patient anymore. So uh, the human part of, uh, of you is uh, not there anymore. And then the, the third one is uh, uh, lack of sense of personal accomplishment. So thinking that what you're doing, doing really doesn't make a difference. Um, so uh, people, uh, physicians that experience this, uh, at least one of these symptoms, um, they're um, uh, qualified for having physician burnout. And um, right now, uh, the, the burnout rate in uh, physicians in the U.S., um, is 43%, which is a, a drop from five years ago. It was 46%. Um, but this is pre-COVID, right? So uh, most likely if they run the, the numbers again, it's going to be much higher. Uh, that's what we are expecting. Um, and this is from a, from a study from the Mayo Clinic uh, that was done throughout 2011 to 2017. And then, uh, so the, the previous number was for physicians in general. And then this is from uh, uh, Medscape. Um, from uh, this year, they did a, um, oops. Okay, they did a, a survey uh, for uh, physicians. And um, if, um, you can see the top um, uh, specialties that suffer burnout are, are primary care, although um, uh, you'll be surprised that uh, urology is, is number one, uh, which it's closer to 50%. Uh, but among, uh, I was surprised about surgery, it's even uh, lower than primary care. And we'll see why in, in a few minutes. But um, so the, in the average is 43, you can see family medicine, internal medicine is uh, 46%. So it's a little bit above uh, uh, the average. And then if we um, 
see the uh, by generation uh, we see more burnout in physicians uh, that are part of the generation X and uh, and we believe that this is because uh, physicians among this age group have more uh, responsibilities especially outside of work uh, family kids um, uh, but we really don't know that's just uh, what the uh, uh, the study thinks that uh, it's a reason for that and then if we break it by gender uh, female physicians have a, a much higher rate of uh, burnout and uh, and we think this is because uh, I mean this is common in other industries too and uh, there was this article from Harvard Harvard Business School and they they say that uh, women take on more uh, work at work so um, they usually do uh, things for the team uh, or they volunteer more and and usually that results in in, um, in burnout and, and there are other things um, that adds up but but uh, this is one of the the big ones and um, then how do physicians cope with burnout so there's some uh, healthy behaviors and then some unhealthy behaviors. And uh, some of the healthy behaviors is exercise, sleeping, uh, hanging out with friends, although this might be difficult now. And, uh, but some uh, physicians uh, do exactly the opposite. And instead of uh, hanging out with friends, they will isolate. And then uh, even worse behaviors, alcohol, um, eating junk food, were one of the uh, some of the behaviors reported in this uh, survey and then uh, this was a very interesting question they, they asked this the same physicians will you take a, a salary reduction to have a better work-life balance and uh, surprisingly it, close to half of them say yes uh, anyone wants uh, wants to guess uh, how much money they were willing to to give, to get a pay cut. Twenty thousand. Well, we'll see. Yeah, it's, it's close to that. So uh, before before that, I want to uh, read this quote um, uh, from Doctor Fisher Wright. She is the president of the MGMA, and uh, she works on. Uh, uh, physician burnout and uh, so she's saying that the, the career expectations are changing and physicians recognize that seeing a smaller number of patients may give them more time with patients and um, sorry and the ability to practice medicine at the height of their license reducing non-clinical hours and enhancing personal satisfaction which ultimately may decrease burnout and extend their career to life. So this is very important because not only uh, we want less burnout, but there is a shortage of physicians. So if they burn out and, and get out of uh, the business of medicine, then that hurts uh, the entire population, right? So, uh, so this uh, physicians, um, uh, the question was, how much annual pay will you give up to have 20% fewer work hours? And these are the, the numbers. And these are uh, classified, uh, divided by, by generation. So uh, Generation X uh, and, and the Millennials, uh, it's about the same, 10000 to $20,000 uh an annual salary to to work 20 percent less hours and then the the boomers uh were willing to give up a little bit more uh i guess because they were ready to to retire and they had less need for money hopefully uh but that that's impressive right i mean uh so really uh doctors want a better uh work-life balance now um uh, talking less about money and more about uh, the emotional toll, um, the uh, the next question was: Are physicians depressed? And and uh, 
the prevalence uh, compared to uh, the average for an adult in the US is almost double. Uh, so, and it's worse in the uh, Generation X. Um, but uh but that's that's uh uh something uh, that uh important and and then worse it's uh, uh 300 to 400 physicians commit suicide a, a year that's a, a big number and also if we compare it to to the general population uh, the rates are higher so here we're showing of those uh in the survey they did um of those physicians that were depressed 22% had suicidal ideation and uh, actually one and two uh, percent uh, actually had an attempt so that's uh, um, sad right um, and so now let's move to uh, the um, what's causing all this burnout right and um, so as you can see there's a long list of uh, contributors but uh, I want to emphasize uh, the top uh, three or four are related to uh, the EHR uh, documentation, uh, EHR, and uh, spending hours at work, which is usually because uh, we have to stay uh, documenting and finishing your progress notes. And then um, uh, the rest are uh, related to uh, compensation, reimbursement, uh, the red tape, uh, the government regulations, uh, but it's kind of also related to uh, documentation. If, if you, for example, have better documentation, you're able to have a better compensation, better reimbursement. Um, uh, right now, everything is fee for service still, so uh, documentation is very important. And uh, there was this um, uh, study that showed that uh, for every two hours of EHR and desk work, uh, there was only one hour of direct clinical face-to-face -face interaction with the patient. So that's kind of like very uh, important to, to, to talk about because, uh, I mean, two-thirds of the time we're, we're in front of the computer or... or uh, dealing with paperwork and then um and then worse is that uh some of this work is not at the office i mean it, we take it to our homes and there's a term that uh now it's called uh pajama time right and uh on average uh physicians in general uh spend one two hours um a week uh, uh completing notes at home right and um this study uh, breaks down the uh, work hours per week. So uh, more than uh, a little bit more than half is face-to-face uh, -face time, but then uh, the other half is uh, EHR and tasks. So um, um, almost, uh, I mean, th there are a lot of different studies, but uh, the numbers are, are similar uh, and uh, they they show that we spend a lot of time in front of the computer, right? So and then this one is it was even more granular. Uh, it, it's this study uh, came from uh, the University of Arizona, and um, they they time um, uh, residents and and faculty, and um, they um, they spend. Uh, on average is uh, 16 minutes and, and 14 seconds uh, that the doctor spends in the EHR per encounter. And then, um, uh, but, but primary care specialties were worse. It, it was uh, more than that, uh, close to 20 minutes, right? So if, if we think about how long is uh, a visit for a patient, I mean, usually it's 15 to 20 minutes, uh, maybe uh, more if it's a physical, but uh, so most of the time was spent in the EHR. So uh, what time do you get to see the patient, right? So, and then uh, of this uh, 16 minutes, um, they broke it down into what you were actually doing in the EHR. So 
Uh, 33% of the time you were doing a chart review, right? Before you see the patient, you, you want to read a little bit of what's going on. And then 24% is uh, documentation. And then 17% uh, uh, of the time you were, it was spent in ordering labs and uh, medications. Um, and then uh, this is per uh, residents. So they uh, broke it down in, uh, by year. And uh, it, the interns were, will spend uh, 60 minutes per patient, which I mean, uh, it's significant. And, and then they will spend uh, close to two hours of uh, pajama time at, at home per month. And then uh, second years uh, spend a little bit less and uh, similar to uh, third years, but they will spend more time at, at home finishing uh, their notes, right? So 10 hours a month and maybe that was just the, the average. So uh, the question that we're posing in this uh, article is, uh, should residents learn EHR documentation or, or patient care, right? Because we spend all this time in that. Uh, in front of the computer, which we could use it for something else. And um, what uh, I want to talk about um, today is uh, some tools that we can use to spend less time uh, in the EHR. Uh, and, uh, and the point is to work smarter and not harder. So let me give you a, a video break. So... Uh, I'm not doing all the talking. Let's see. Any questions so far? Okay, okay. So now let's move to, to the tools uh, to prevent physician burnout. Uh, and uh, we're gonna uh, break this down in uh, four uh, categories. The, the first one is to make the, the actual documentation more efficient. Um, and uh, to write your notes faster. And then we're gonna uh, touch a little bit about uh, the, the workflows and then uh, how to expedite your orders for labs, imaging, medications. And then um, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, managing your messages um, and your inbox. Um, So, um, so how to write your note faster? So there are different uh, solutions. Uh, the first one is scribes. I don't know if uh, uh, anyone, uh, I don't know if they, usually ER doctors are the ones who who's use uh, scribes, but uh, uh, they're expensive. Their uh, average is $25 an hour. So uh it's it's i mean if you ask a ER doctor if they will go back to work if they didn't have scribe probably they will tell you no uh the, so the scribes are, are a great option but it's expensive right and then uh the ama for example um they they talk about team documentation and uh they, they talk about the the ma um writing part of the note and even having two MAs, uh, but but same thing is expensive and and uh, usually the MAs. Uh, I mean, we, we try to implement this at my clinic, and 
uh, the AMAs uh, were not motivated because they were, were getting paid the same and, and uh, that's uh, out of their uh, expertise, uh, kind of like doing the documentation, they didn't feel comfortable. And then uh, some companies are coming up with artificial intelligence and um, and that's a very cool technology, uh, also expensive. Usually it's more focused for uh, orthopedics and, and uh, the, the specialties that can't pay for that. And it's, it's not really, uh, I think in, in five or 10 years, we're gonna uh, have uh, uh, this technology that will help doctors. But for now, uh, I think uh, it's, it's not there yet. We're not there yet. Um, so um, let, let's try to talk about the documentation and what are the goals. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are only three important goals of uh, uh, documentation. One is uh, continuity of care so that you can tell your colleagues uh, that read your note uh, what's going on with the patient or, or for yourself to remind yourself next time you see the patient during follow up. And then the second one is for billing, right? Uh, if it's not documented, it can't be billed. So it's very important uh, to document what you're doing, otherwise you don't get paid. And then the third one is uh, for legal coverage. So it defends you against malpractice, right? So uh, it's always important to, to document uh, your clinical rationale uh, so that if something happens, uh, it's documented. It's sometimes the only thing that we have to defend ourselves. Um, so um, it will be so much easier if we could go back to the old days where we, the doctors use index cards, right? Just a, a short uh, one-liner and uh, you were done with the note. And actually, um, Medicare uh, has this initiative called Patients Over Paperwork uh, that is coming up in, in 2021 and hopefully will, will help a little bit. And what they're trying to do is the, uh, the only thing that is going to really matter is the assessment and plan uh, of your note. Right now, um, the complexity of the visit takes elements from the physical exam and the HPI. Um, uh, so now, uh, actually, they, they roll out uh, a version of this already with, with the uh, virtual visits uh, and telemedicine. Um, they, they only take a look at the, the assessment and plan. But, um, but anyways, that's going to be exciting. We'll see what happens next year if it really uh, helps physicians. And uh, so right now, what happens we, with a note, for example, for a cold if, have you ever print, printed your, your, your note for a simple cold or a short visit? It's like at least three pages of, of uh, information that uh, just is bloating the, the, the note, right? So uh, another thing that uh, will help you uh, write um, shorter notes and, uh, and save you time is using bullet points. So you don't have to write a, a novel. Uh, uh, and this can help you uh, to write a concise and accurate documentation. And, um, and you don't have to worry too much about the grammar and the spelling, uh, as long as you uh, put the information and then people can realize what you're uh, thinking, that's, that's good enough. And um, you know that the burden of documentation uh, falls in, uh, to uh, physicians mainly, but this is not the case uh, in other professions, like for example, lawyers have uh, paralegals and uh, they they do all the documentation, and uh, you know they um, if they're gonna write a, a contract, they don't start from scratch, right? They have uh, templates, and and then like dentists will have the hygienist, so they're checking your teeth and measuring uh, your gum, uh, and then someone is, is typing for them, right? And, and we have uh, dragons, right? We have dragon dictation. And, uh, and it's, it's a, an important tool for, for documentation. I mean, you uh, can uh, usually dictate faster than writing six times faster. Usually a physician average uh, um, 
speed for, for documentation is 35 words per minute. As scribe, it's close to, to 70. Uh, but uh, some people uh, have this technology available. I don't know if you guys have uh, dictation in your hospital. Yes, okay. So, so uh, some doctors don't, don't feel uh, comfortable using it, but that, that's an important tool that uh, really saves time, right? Um, so we talk about the dictation. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, dot phrases and, and templates. And um, so the, the whole uh, point of uh, using dot phrases and templates is to avoid repetitive typing, right? So if a patient comes with a UTI, I mean, they usually have the same symptoms. <laughs> they have dysuria and urgency and frequency and, uh, and you uh, usually end up doing the same exam and the same uh, treatment for everyone unless they're allergic to something, right? Um, so if, if you find yourself uh, typing something uh, uh, repetitively uh, two or three times, then it's, it's time to invest some time in, in creating a dot phrase. And uh, I mean, it takes time, but then it's, it's time well invested because uh, uh, the next patient that comes with UTI, you just do a few clicks and then you have your dot phrase, right? Um, are you guys, uh, uh, do you use the, uh, dot phrases in your EHR? Okay, okay. Anyway, so, so the whole, um, sorry, you were saying something? Okay, so the whole point about um, expediting your documentation is that you use the actual time that you spend in front of the, uh, in the room with the patient, uh, spend, spend it with the patient instead of the computer, right? Uh, so that's uh, uh, something that, at least for me, uh, has helped me a lot to, to spend more time with the patient and um, uh, this, this actually helps with patient satisfaction and uh, other things. Um, and uh, other techniques that you can use, you know, some people copy paste their, their notes, which um, it's really not recommended because, I mean, you can, uh, your notes are not, not gonna be reliable. It's hazardous because uh, you can get in trouble. But then there is this thing called copy forward uh, so, I don't know, for example, if you have your uh, patient that comes every three months for follow-up of your diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, I mean, there's uh, uh, not a lot of things that change, right? Uh, so, if, if you copy that uh, and, and only use the relevant information and then meticulously update everything, then that's a, an okay approach, right? Um, so this study from the ABFM journal shows that uh, template-guided medical documentation increases reimbursement levels and also the levels of physician satisfaction. So, uh, so there are studies that show that uh, doing this uh, helps. So now let's move into uh, workflows. So uh, this is a quote from Benjamin Franklin. If you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. So uh, do you guys do huddles in your clinic? Excellent. So uh, that's a great thing to, to uh, plan the day, right? So you can anticipate who's going to get a vaccine and if uh, someone's going to get a skin tag removed or uh, if you're going to check the hemoglobin to this patient and uh, stuff that... Uh, if your MA already knows that this is going to happen, then uh, you don't have to get out of the room and tell the, the MA, I need this and that. So it saves time. Um, and then uh, some people do uh, pre-sharding and uh, before the, even the clinic starts, they review all the uh, notes and even start their uh, the chart for the visits. And uh, I actually... Uh, started doing that when I was in residency, but uh, it wasn't very helpful for me. Maybe for other doctors it's helpful, but uh, 
I won't forget about uh, the second or third patient. Uh, so what I do is I call it real-time pre-sharding. So, uh, and this is basically doing a shard review of your previous visit note. And then uh, you have to tell your MA to, to capture a good shift complaint. Um, and uh, so just not just the uh, patients here for follow-up, right? So actually put some something with uh, that actually reflects uh, the agenda of the patient. And uh, so you tr the, the whole point is to try to identify the problem list, right? So if it's this uh, follow-up for diabetes or the patient comes for, for a mole or uh, so you have a sense of what's going on. And then once you have the idea of what's going on, if you are using your dot phrases, um, you can pre-populate the shard uh, with, with all the uh, information. You can put the HPI, the, the physical and the assessment and plan. And then now with 80% uh, of your notes uh, done, you, then you go see a patient and then you use edit as you go instead of typing the whole note uh, while you see the patient or afterwards, which is worse. Um, so uh, this is how it will look like. Um, so you, this is before you see the patient, you will type uh, uh, your, your dot phrase, right? And this is, for example, a patient that came with uh, hypertension, uh, diabetes, and uh, hyperlipidemia follow-up. And then, um, it's good to have a good physical exam uh, template. I, the one that I use, I call it the, the not touch physical exam. So it covers nine organ systems, which are required for billing. And they're all uh, basic things that you can tell from just saying hi and shaking the patient hand. Um, and then the assessment and plan. And then uh, now that you have the your note, you go and see the patient and then you start editing. So yeah, just patients just taking metformin and he's exercising and compliant. And, uh, and you know, this, this, uh, usually it should reflect what you ask the patient in uh, every visit. Right. Um, and then you move up to, physical exam if you need to edit something um, and then you edit your uh, assessment and plan so um, let's say that the diabetes is not controlled so we're gonna add glipicide so you as you see you do just uh, a little edits that uh, reflect what's going on with the uh, during the visit but uh it took less than two minutes to complete the full note right uh and um so um so if if you want to go to the next level um you can even uh pre-input the order so let's say you have a diabetic and uh, you know that he's due for his a1c so even before you enter the room, you uh, uh, order the A1C and the microalbumin or whatever you're gonna order. And, and then even you could pre-input the IC10 codes and even the billing. And you know, you can always edit, uh, let's say the patient also has a mole. Well, you, you can add that uh, at the end of the visit or, or maybe uh, we didn't talk about uh, diabetes and hypertension well you just delete it but but most of the time you you it's gonna save you uh, time and then uh, another thing that uh, I, I realize is that um, you know uh, you tend to to um, put as much as you can in your notes and then uh, you finish with the patient and uh, you know, you were always running late, right? So uh, the next patient has been waiting for 10, 15 minutes. So you, uh, you don't finish your note and then you start with the next one. And usually this uh, backfires because then you're gonna spend more time at the end of the day uh, finishing your note. So it's easier to, 
even make the next patient wait a, a minute or two, finish your note, and everything is fresh in your mind. And um, instead of that, if you if you don't do that and you uh, wait until lunchtime to catch up or at the end of the day, then you have to remember if the patient was complaining of uh, right knee pain or left knee pain. So it will take you longer, right? So it's and then another thing that uh, some some especially uh, interns sometimes don't feel comfortable uh, uh, documenting and they will write it in a piece of paper. So and that, so that's double work, right? You write all the information in, in your uh, in a piece of paper and then put it in the computer and then edit. So that's a, a good thing that uh, uh, interns uh, should should learn. Um, so the third one, uh, it's uh, labs and orders. So, so this study showed that um, it takes um, 62 clicks to order a Tylenol. So from, uh, from starting your computer and getting to EHR and uh, going all the way to ordering a Tylenol is 62 clicks, right? So that's, that's a lot. Uh, and then uh, the worst part is there is an error rate of 7%. So that's crazy. Um, and uh, one thing that um, you should do, uh, it's uh, having a good set of favorites. And um, I'm going to show you, uh, this is from, from uh, the blog in my website. If you are interested, just, just go to statnote.com. And um, I have a, a pretty good layout of like common labs. So let's say if you have a patient uh, with, comes pregnant, this is the panel you usually order, or someone has been having diarrhea for uh, more than a week. So well, you'll order these labs. Uh, let's say someone comes with uh, polymyalgia and uh, polyotralgia. So you decide to do some rheumatologic workup. So instead of putting uh, looking for the order and uh, so if you have a save it's just four clicks and you're done right uh, so that's for labs and then imaging um, you should have your chest x-ray your knee x-ray uh, uh, immunizations um, traveler I mean this is uh, one of the things that are like it comes like every few months right you have a traveler and oh what vaccines I'm gonna order and, and how do I order it so uh, you spend all you lose a lot of time trying to figure out so if you save them uh, save you time or the common vaccines that you get uh, every day your flu shot the pneumonia shot and then uh, point of care testing um, so your hemoglobin uh, rapid strap and then um, other things like EKG, if you're going to order a stress test. Um, and then if you're going to order, I don't know, like a Toradol or you have a patient uh, that needs some, um, some antibiotics for an STD, you, you put it there, right? And then uh, prescriptions. So uh, um, this is what I use is uh, classified by kind of like disease and uh, organ system. So if it's a new diabetic, this is usually what I order. So you, you can you can customize it as, as you wish. And then um, smoker have nicotine patches, Chantix. And uh, sometimes I don't know if in your EHR how it works, but um, usually you refer patients, let's say for uh, diabetic retinopathy screen. So instead of typing the same every time you order. Uh, Referral, you might be uh, able to say something like this. Anyway, so let's go back to um, give me one second. How do I get? Okay, perfect. Um, sorry about that. Uh, 
Okay. So, so that will save you a lot of time um, with um, orders. And then uh, the last one is uh, messages. Um, you know, uh, it takes uh, 22% of the, your workday, as if you recall the, the earlier um, slide. Um, And it's worse for primary care physicians. Uh, usually, surgical specialties uh, see uh, less amount of what uh, deal with less amount of messages that we do. Uh, we do with twice the amount of, of messages. If you compare it to a uh, uh, CEO from a Fortune 500 company, they on average get 70 emails uh, a day, and that's pretty much where we get as primary care, uh, close to 70 messages a day. And uh, when I saw this, I went uh, and and checked how many uh, how many messages I had, and this was a hump day. I had twenty urgent messages, fifteen results, two proposed orders, seventy five documents to sign or review, twenty six uh, regular messages, ten renewal requests. So uh, I was venting on on Twitter and. Um, but uh, this, some of my dot phrases uh, have uh, templates uh, for, uh, for common lab results to communicate with patients. So uh, simple uh, sentences, but, but will uh, save you time. And I even have some in Spanish and, um, and English. Anyway, so um, some handy tips for dealing with messages. Um, if it's a normal result, uh, you can just send a letter or uh, a message in the portal. Uh, if it's an abnormal result, uh, maybe just uh, message your staff with instructions like, hey, just uh, let's say an A1C was high, uh, you have a template, call the patient, make sure it's paid compliant and uh, make sure he doesn't miss his next visit. Uh, if it's an urgent result, well, cal you can call the patient yourself, right? Uh, but that's uh, kind of how I uh, break it down. And, and then uh, this was uh, a lesson that I learned from my uh, residency program director. Uh, she was, uh, I was getting behind with, with uh, all the paperwork and then she told me, well, you know, if you touch uh, the paper, uh, then you have to deal with it. And uh, unless it's gonna take you more than like two minutes, then you can leave it uh, for later. But uh, if it's something that's gonna take you uh, a minute to deal with, just uh, go ahead and uh, deal with it. If you uh, delay it, then uh, it's gonna take you um, more time and you're doing double work, right? Because you, when you get the paper, usually you read it and you pretty much come up with a plan of what's, uh, what you need to do. So you might as well just do it right there and then. Um, some other uh, recommendations, um, the schedule time to process your messages. Um, I don't know, uh, usually um, it should be 30 minutes in the morning, another time of 30 minutes or an hour in the afternoon, something like that. Um, and then another one is uh, avoid the urge to empty your inbox, right? So you don't need to have a inbox zero. You have 48 hours to to respond to a patient, that's usually the standard. Uh, you should deal with the urgent ones, but you don't have to deal with all the messages right away. And then uh, develop workflows to make your life easier. So uh, for example, uh, when, I don't know if, uh, if this happens to you guys, but when uh, Renitidin uh, at the FDA was recalling it, that was getting a lot of messages from patients that they thought they were going to get cancer and they, they wanted a, a, another anti-acid medication. So, so I developed this uh, workflow with my MA. So every time something like that happened, just right away, uh, uh, send me a proposal for Pepsi, right? Or something like that. So that, that, that can save you time. Um, and then the canned responses that I showed you earlier. And then uh, take advantage of any downtime. If there's a no-show, uh, deal with the messages because otherwise they're just going to start piling up. And then uh, ask the staff to label important messages so that way you know which ones you need to deal with right away. Um, uh, when you reply to a message, um, 
put all the information there so uh, so that you don't get a second message uh, asking with uh, more questions so write this if this happens then i want you to do this right so if this then that scenarios um and then uh, don't waste your time um uh, responding with thank you and tell your staff that uh, you don't need messages saying thank you or fyis that are not really important uh, they just gonna create more messages for you to read and then uh, uh prioritize and sort so it's always good to uh, when you're gonna deal with your messages sort your messages and then uh the ones that way you can you want to deal with i don't know all the refills or all the um uh, referrals uh but uh so it's a good way to do that and then the other thing is uh you need to learn how to delegate um and and uh, so uh, for residents for example it's good to to call the patients with results but uh i mean after doing it for so long you you need to uh ask for help let other people uh help you especially with the low level tasks because otherwise it's never gonna end and then um well when you know this this uh when you're in the clinic make every second count and it's important to start in time um you know for example when, uh, when you start in the morning uh let's say your clinic starts at eight but it's uh it's always certain that you're gonna the first patient you're gonna start seeing the patient like at 8 15 or something like that right so uh, uh go ahead and and uh, take advantage of that uh, time and then the other thing is um to help each other right if you see uh, a resident uh, a colleague that is running behind if you can help them that's always appreciated um anyways well thank you so much for for your time put any any questions Okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, please feel free to uh, reach me. Um, you can go to uh, uh, my website and I, I try to post a blog every month with, with uh, interesting things. You can uh, subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, there is a book that I have uh, with all these dot phrases, although hopefully you got the USB with all of them. And if you wanna follow us in, in social media, uh, that's, that's great if we can continue the conversation and um, and then spread the word. <laughs> it will help me out a lot. Uh, with, uh, we're, we're launching um, the stick that, that uh, I, you guys got. We're going to launch it this week on, on Amazon and uh, see how it goes.